Hello everyone, this is Mark Holfe, Canadian immigration lawyer, ex-immigration officer and former high school teacher coming to you live today at noon, October the 9th, Mountain Standard Time with another EE Live Q&A. It's great to have you guys join me and I'm looking forward to answering a number of questions that you have about express entry. I have just a few written ones that I'm going to do today because I wanted to save more time to answer live questions. And let's face it, those are more enter entertaining. So it's great to be able to interact with you guys live. I was going to have a guest on today again, but it didn't work out. So we'll push that forward to next week um, to have the guest join me. As always, everybody, remember this Express Entry Live Q&A session is sponsored by the Complete Step-by-Step -step Guide to Doing It Yourself. And uh, you can access that very easily by going to the Canadian Immigration Institute.com website and you can subscribe right there. So I will take that one. I'll pull that one off. Um, another thing while we're waiting for people to log in that I want to share, especially with all you YouTubers out there who are watching this as a recorded video and those on the Express Entry Law Private Facebook group as well, I have right now a special promotion that is coming to an end and I don't have it on here. I probably should have done that. Let's see if I can get over here in the right location. So this, as you can see, um, I'm offering a 50% off the the, the full representation that I offer through my firm, but this is coming to an end tomorrow. And so if I go on here and let's see if I can create a new text overlay, this will expire on October the 10th. So let's put this in and see what it looks like here. Ah, there we go. <laughs> okay. So you can see here, this offer right here will expire on October the 10th, which is tomorrow at, at midnight Mountain Standard Time. So if you're looking to access this, you need to reach out to me immediately. And uh, as long as you send me an email and request to be locked in, I'll lock you in. Um, right now, Charlene, my assistant, she is tearing her hair out. <laughs> <laughs> trying to keep track of everybody that has requested um, full representation at this rock bottom price. And I can tell you guys, as I've talked about this before, Ada, who's been working with me on these files, had to go home back to Nigeria um, for uh, personal reasons. And because of that, um, I am not going to be offering this until I know what the status of that is. So after tomorrow, I will not be offering this anymore and it will return back to this amount right over here, the 5,000, which is the traditional route and how much I usually charge for full representation. So I just wanted to bring that to all of your attention. And I'm also going to, while we're talking here, I'm going to go in, I'm going to move this out of the way. I'm going to slide back here. I'm going to get rid of this one and I'm going to go to my screen and pull up the actual live video on my own computer here which is always a little bit challenging, but let's see if we can find it here. And there it is. Okay, so I'm gonna click on that so I can see all of you fine folks who are connecting in. So make sure as always, leave a comment. Let me know where you're listening from. Um, it always is enjoyable to see all the different places that people are tuning in. So please go ahead and do that. And uh, looks like we've got actually quite a bunch of people that are piling in here. So that's awesome for today. Okay, I want to just share my screen quickly with you. So here's the screen. I'm going to go back and right at the top of the page, people are wondering, Mark, how do I take advantage of this offer? We'll just go to the very top of the Express Entry Law um, private banner image and you'll see right there that the offer expires um, uh, the 10th. And actually, I said midnight. I stand corrected. It's 4.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time because that's when my assistant gets your email. Um, so $2,500 and that uh, is the legal fees and then disbursements and tax are after that. And uh, you can just send an email to charlene at stringham.ca. That's my legal assistant. And you can see it up there on the banner image as well. And those of you who are not on Facebook can actually probably search for Express Entry Law private Facebook group anyways on Facebook and maybe be able to pull it up even if you're not a member. But regardless, I'll put that in the description in the YouTube channel so that you guys will have that. And it's the last chance because it's not going back down to this. And it was an interesting experiment. It was. But at the end of the day, it's um, it's not an offer that I'm going to extend any longer than tomorrow. And then it's going to return back to the 5000 And I'm going to continue moving forward as a Canadian immigration lawyer with Canadian immigration lawyer fees. All right, guys. I have spent enough time gibbering about that. Um, I want to... Uh, 
uh, let you guys know that this past weekend was Thanksgiving and we had an absolutely wonderful time with my family. Um, I was actually going to show you one little image here while we're waiting for a few other people to log in here before we get started. I wanted to show you what I did with my son here if I can find the picture. I was going to post it. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see if I can find a little image with me and my son here. There it is. All right. Let's see if I can pull this up. See, this is this is what life is like as a Canadian immigration lawyer when you've got consults and files and important matters all leading up to about five minutes before you start your live uh, your live video, and then you're scrambling because you want to do all these things and you just didn't have time to do it. So you fine folks are going to have to just bear with me as I do the best I can to. Uh, um, to, to try to share the stuff that I'm trying to share and it's not very organized and we're all over the place and maybe one day I'll be so rich that I will be able to hire someone to do all this for me but that's not the case right now so <laughs> so hopefully all of you guys uh, can bear with me as I'm trying to do all of these wonderful things okay I think I succeeded okay I'm going to show you this image here this was my weekend yesterday with my son let's see if I've got it Okay, there it is. Yeah. So there's Connor and me and we went strolling um, back in the trees and the, the really it's a mountain, a mountain range behind us. And this little stream was flowing by, but you can see there's snow. So we went looking for animal tracks and um, and we love when it snows because then you can actually see all the different animals that have been crawling around the territory. And so let me see if I can find a track here to share with you. Let's see. I'm scrolling through all my images and it's interesting because the whole, uh, okay, there's a few. Okay. I'll share this one with you guys. I think you'll get a kick out of this one as well. See if it wants to, oh, it's actually a video. Well, I'll show you the video then. It wasn't quite what I intended to, but all right, let's see what we got here. If I can share this video with you. All right. And then I will end here. And people are wondering, Mark, why the heck are you sharing all this stuff with all of us? And some of you are like, just get to answering questions. I don't want to hear what you're doing in your life. And uh, the reason I do it is so that all of you fine people can realize and understand that I am a real human being and that I have a life and that I have more things going on than just immigration, but that you can trust me because I am just like you. I may be here on the other side of the, the world and I might be... Um, uh, trying to do what I can to help people with their immigration. But at the end of the day, this is um, my livelihood and it's how I provide for my family. So let me see if I can find this. I thought I just moved it over, but now it has disappeared on me. Let's see. Wow. I just had it and I think I, I deleted it. Let's try this again. And I'm sure lots of you guys... Um, uh, where you have snow in your countries, I'm sure without a doubt that you are uh, uh, have similar experiences. Okay, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to share this screen. I'm not sure if you can hear it, but I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to click on this and see if this works. Hmm, it doesn't. Interesting. I don't know why that isn't working. Okay, that's right. I have an idea. I have an idea. Here it comes. Let's see if we can do this. You guys are pretty patient with me and I appreciate that. <laughs> okay, let's try this again. Okay, I think I can do this now. Okay, I think I'm in business now. Oh, there it is. Okay, here we go. I'm gonna get rid of this one and then I'm gonna put this one up here and I'm gonna share it with you guys. So you can see here, this is the bird that we were tracking and there's our footprint there. But this is what we did with my son. We, we basically go and look in the snow and we try to see what animals they are. This one, I think, is probably a ptarmigan. Um, it's a little bird that uh, is actually a game bird in Canada, so you can hunt it if you like. But that, I think, is probably a ptarmigan track, a little bird track. Anyways, so, so there you go. <laughs> that's... <laughs> that's that's what I have going on in my life and it was awesome it was about minus one minus two but we had a great time me and Connor all right so that's what's going on in Mark Holthy's world and it was a wonderful Thanksgiving weekend and um, it sure gives you an opportunity to just understand how fortunate you are and anyone who is living in Canada 
really has very, very little to complain about. It's a wonderful country and there are so many opportunities and I can tell you it's an absolute pleasure for me to connect with all of you awesome people and help you giving, basically giving you guys the best shot that you can get uh, to qualify to receive an ITA and ultimately become a permanent resident of Canada. And I know that despite the best, you know, the, the, the best um, intentions of myself and my, my greatest dreams, I would love to have all of you come. But that's not the way the system works. So a lot of you have seen that right now anyone under 440 really is not even giving an opportunity anymore. And so if you have less than 440 comprehensive ranking system points through the general provisions of express entry, your likelihood of qualifying is really low and uh, it may not even be possible anymore. And that's all the more reason if you're right around that, that range that you seriously consider getting help with your application. And the reality is people that have done it themselves rely on all of you guys out there who say, you don't need to hire anyone, you can do it yourself. At the end of the day, one simple little mistake, and I've already had a number of people reach out to me just this week asking me to try to help them because they made a mistake with their birth certificate or they didn't translate the, um, well, I should say they didn't translate the birth certificate of one of their children. And so the whole application got returned, which put them right back into the queue, which resulted in them having to get redrawn again. But now maybe they've had a birthday. Now they lose five more points. So now instead of being drawn at 441, they're at 436 or something like that. And they're not going to get drawn again. So the consequences are pretty massive, you guys. But regardless, that's uh, it comes back down to this. Up until tomorrow, I will continue to offer ooh, this gold full representation at 2,500, which is 50% off what I usually charge. And if you reach out to Charlene at stringham.ca, and um, like I said, if I pull this off and I go back here um, and then share my screen again, you'll see here right at the top. If you send an email to Charlene at stringham.ca and let her know you're interested, I will honor it up until tomorrow. But after tomorrow, that is coming to an end. All right. So, wow, this is crazy. These, these EE live Q and A's have a life of their own. And half of the time when I turn on that mic and I start talking, I don't even know where it's going to go. So, uh, I appreciate you guys, your patience and hanging in with me. All right. So let's take a look. I'm going to once again, open up my own view of this so I can see everybody's uh, questions and comments. I'm going to turn this down here. And okay, let's see where everybody's tuning in from. So Tamid is tuning in from Dhaka. Very cool. Um, Cyril is watching from Exeter, UK. Awesome. Um, Xiaoshuan is Alabama. Cool. Uh, Igbo is watching from Germany. Henry's from Nigeria. Uh, uh, Siwa says, is this offer also applies to those who want to apply Nova Scotia PNP and PR? No, it's not. It's just purely for express entry. I do help people with that, but it's the regular rate of $5,000. Good question, Siwa. Um, Kishan is from listening from Sarnia. Very cool. Jasmine is Jeddah. Bushra is Spain. Um, Jasmine says, snowing already. Yes, it is. It was miserable this morning. In fact, I was late for one of my consults. Fortunately, she was so patient and she was reach, she was calling me from Trinidad. We did a nice Skype call and she was very patient, but I got tied up in traffic and was a little bit late getting into the office for my 8 a.m. appointment with her. All right, Nav is from Canada. Cool. Asadur is Dhaka. Awesome. This is so cool, you guys. Great. I'm so, so happy. Um, and uh, Gia, I'll also give a shout out to you from Malaysia. So you can see people are tuning in from all over. And those of you who are tuning in um, on the other side in the Asia Pacific area, I know that it's like midnight there. So you guys are diehards and I really, really value you being a part of this. Okay. And Amarjeet says India. So yeah, I know it's about uh, 1230 or 1 a.m. there in the morning. So awesome. Okay, let's dive in now and let's start answering people's questions. So right off the bat, and remember those of you who are tuning in, I have only one, two, three, I've got four, I think four questions I'm gonna answer here. And then I'm gonna give the rest of the time to all of you guys who have come and are watching this live. All right, I'm just gonna grab my pen. Okay, and the pen is always a magical thing because 
that's how I can put time stamps on your question so that other people who are watching it as a recording are able to just click on it and then find it. Okay, I'm gonna drop this down. You can probably hear me okay. All right, so those of you who are posting your comments in the comment section, hold off for now. I'm gonna do the ones that were sent in by email. And then after that, um, I will get to everybody's live questions. And as always, my faithful Ralph Hansky has joined. It's good to see you, Ralph. Okay, um, those of you, if you're wondering, hey, what's this EE Live Q&A all about? Well, me, Mark Holdy, Canadian immigration lawyer, at noon every Tuesday, Mountain Standard Time, I try to do a live Q&A for all of you guys. And that's basically what this is. So people can send me in an email to right here, mholthy at stringham.ca. And if you put this EE Live Q&A in the subject line, I will then consider your question as a potential one for an upcoming EE Live Q&A. And so there's no guarantee it's going to be the very next one. But generally speaking, if you send it in, I try to consider it if you are going to be drawn um, for the next one coming up. All right, so that's one way to do it. And then the other is to come and watch live. And so those watching on YouTube, if you go to the Express Entry Law Private Facebook group, that's where you can interact with me live. Maybe I'll figure it out on YouTube. Maybe I'll start doing it on YouTube if I can figure out a way to interact. Um, but at this stage right now, this seems to work the best. All right. And so let's take a look at the first question. And if we're looking at time, this is at about 1630. Okay, so this one is from uh, Vesha. And Vesha says, good day. Thank you very much for all your responses thus far. When doing an affidavit for listing the job duties and responsibilities, if it wasn't stated on the job letter, does it have to match the ones of the not code on the CIC website exactly? For instance, the CIC website has order office supplies and maintain inventory. The affidavit, order and maintain inventory of office supplies and other items. Okay, this is a very, very easy, easy one, Vesha. So what Vesha is referring to is the National Occupational Classification System. So if I go on here and share my screen with you, I'm going to pull this up and I'm going to type in NOC 2016 because that is, and I'm going to make this a little bit bigger here so that everybody can see it. And I'm going to click on it here. Okay. And so if we take um, a position, we'll say 1122, good old consultant here. So if we take this position here, you'll see, actually, do you know what? We're going to put here instead, um, actually, no, this is fine. Okay, so basically what Vesha is saying is, is that in here, you'll see there are main duties. And IRCC, or the Canadian government, requires you, in order to claim this work experience, as being uh, a part of your express entry application, you have to have performed a substantial number of these main duties. So obviously these duties have to be listed in your reference letter, but in the case of Vesha, um, the employer wasn't willing to put the, uh, the duties in there and that's fine, it happens. So then there's some other statement or affidavit from a colleague or a supervisor or someone else. Now remember, your own affidavit isn't gonna be helpful. It has to be some third party who knows and can attest and swear that they saw you performing these duties or had knowledge that this is what you were doing. And so in the case of Esha, she says, "Do I cop should we copy these words exactly? Well, think about it for a minute. I'm going to put my immigration officer hat on here. Um, I'm going to jump back here to full screen. But I'm going to put my immigration officer hat on. I don't really have a hat. Uh, put my phone on or something <laughs> and, and, and look at this. If I have a reference letter that mirrors exactly the duty set out in the NOC, I'm going to start to wonder if that's really what the person did. Because remember, this National Occupational Classification System, it is only for the purposes of um, immigration. Well, and jobs in Canada, but not in your country. So yes, the duties need to be similar, but maybe your organization is going to define your duties in a different way. They still, they still substantially encompass each of these things that we have right here, right? They still cover all of these things. But if you have them in, worded exactly as they are here in the, in the NOC, I think an officer is going to wonder whether or not that is actually legitimate or whether you're just doing it just to satisfy immigration. And in all honesty, you didn't actually perform those duties. So I always, always recommend with my clients that when you are uh, working with your employer to put this together, clearly you're going to select all the duties that you actually perform. 
You're never going to misrepresent anything, but you're going to describe them as you would in your with your company. The reference letters that are the ones that were already pre-created by your um, by the company. If they do have duties, then I include that. If it's an affidavit, then yeah, you got a lot of flexibility. But the reality is, it doesn't have to be exactly worded word for word. In fact, I like the variation. And so, Vesha, you had here, it was reordered a little bit and mixed up, but I don't have any issues with that at all. You've got the same substantial duty of ordering the office supplies and maintaining inventory in both. And so, I think what you've got here is great. So, I don't have any issues with that at all. But remember, everyone, that when you are getting a letter done to support your work experience, what we're talking about here is the National Occupational, National Occupational Classification System for 2016. And so this one right here is the one that you're going to use. So you can see right here is, is the 2016. Now, I also have, if I can find it here. Okay, this question is a little bit of a continuation but it also relates back to this profile right here. So, except this time, we're gonna do something a little bit different and we're gonna follow exactly what this listener has given me as an example. So, 1111 is basically an accountant. Excuse me, and this is from uh, Bebek. And Bebek says, um, Dear Mark, how are you doing? I am one of the silent followers of your YouTube channel. Cool, that's awesome. And see, you guys out there, that are watching on YouTube, I listen to you as well as the people in the Facebook group. So you do have a shot of getting your question answered just, to, just the same. And um, just for those of you who are tuning in, maybe through our Facebook page, I just want you guys to remember that if you go to YouTube, on YouTube here, I actually have a separate page, which I find is so much easier for keeping track of videos um, than face the Facebook page. But this is my Canadian Immigration Institute YouTube channel. And we're at 10,605 subscribers now. But here's all the videos, guys. They're all here. So if you're looking for one place where you get information on all kinds of different things related to Express Entry, it's all here. There's even testimonials from the people who purchased my guides. There's me riding my horse back in the mountains. There's, there's everything here. So you guys can see, I've got a ton of information on here. And it's all available for all of you awesome people at the rock bottom price of free. <laughs> so remember that, Canadian Immigration Institute. So back to our screen here. Bebek is a follower with YouTube. Um, it looks like he's also a Facebook page and my podcast, which is the Canadian Immigration Podcast. Um, he says, I've watched almost all of the EE Live sessions, um, but haven't seen this answer. Well, I think you might have missed it, but we'll see. So the, the answer, the question here is, it says, um, I'm currently working as an article trainee. So he's not a full accountant necessarily, but he's an articling student. And we have that in Canada. So let's take a look here and you'll see here duties, internal auditor, accountant, financial, chief accountant. Let's take a look at all the other titles here. So we're going to open this one up here for Bebek. And Bebek says that um, an articling student is on the list. So I'm going to do this, find articling. Let's see. Let's see if we can pull it up. Uh, doesn't see it. Let's try again here. Let's see. We've got the same one level article trainee. Okay. So let's see here if there's a trainee on here. I don't see a trainee. This is, this is working semi okay. I'm trying to find um, the spot. I know that on here, um, articling students, are definitely included because it's the same thing as with uh, lawyers. So before I could practice as a full lawyer with within Alberta and be a member of the Law Society, there we go. Ha ha, found it. Chartered accountant student. And that's really what we're looking at here. CA student. Perfect. So those are the ones that I'm looking for. So basically, they are a trainee, someone in training. And so the question then becomes, um, uh, and this is the question that Bebek had without getting into a lot of details. It says, can I claim my experience while I was studying full time in the undergraduate course? Um, and so what do I do when necessarily he says I wasn't qualified to practice in the occupation because I didn't yet have my degree. So when it comes to articling students, we often do have our degrees, 
but sometimes student trainees, then it comes down to the duties. If you were performing all of these duties, Bibek, then that's the most important part that you that you can demonstrate either as an auditor or as an accountant, whatever the case may be, that you can perform a substantial number of these main duties. If you can, that's the only hurdle that you have to that you have to provide. That and that you're paid and that you meet the other requirements of skilled work. But these employment requirements that are down here, and this is what Bebek was getting at, it shows that um, that chartered accountants require a university degree and complete the professional training. Well, Bebek didn't have that. Well, guys, when it comes to express entry and skilled work experience, it doesn't matter. You do not need to have education, the education that the NOC says um, in your country. It's a different story in Canada, um, technically, technically, but the reality is if you performed a substantial number of the main duties, then you can claim that work experience for express entry, okay, regardless of what it says here. So, um, Anytime it says that something is required, um, so you can see require a university degree, then it's mandatory. Um, but that is just for the purposes of Canada or for the purposes of you coming uh, and obtaining a work permit to work in Canada. Getting credit for your foreign work experience at a skilled level only requires that you perform a substantial number, which is about 75% of the main duties listed here, okay? So that's really good. And then the next part of this answer, Bebek, is that you do not have to have education that matches your um, occupation. And it seems like every day, I'm gonna go back to my YouTube channel here, and because I've got this, uh, technically, um, I'm gonna put this link here. Let me go here, I'm gonna go to my channel, and then I go to videos, and then I had a little bit of a run where I did an express entry tip of the day which I think I may be returning to. But at this stage, we'll just scroll down. So you can see there's a bunch in here. And we'll get to it. Let's see if I can find the one. Okay, here it is. So, uh, do, 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 which one is it? Does my education. So right here, this is the one. So I'm gonna click on there. And then I'm going to, I'll click on edit video, just so I can get this link. I probably didn't need to do that, but that's okay. Um, so I'll do that and then I will go back into our group right here if I can find it and I'm going to post, that's interesting, I'm going to post a link right there for you. So that is the one of the best places that you can go to get information on education and how it matches with your job description. But for you, Bebek, you don't need to worry about it and as long as you're, even if you're going to school, as long as you're meeting the minimum hour requirements, you're being paid. And remember, the minimum hour requirements are 30 hours a week. And so as long as you've got those things taken care of, you've performed a substantial number of the main duties, then you're going to be in good shape. Um, and then obviously that your employer confirms that you are working at the level of a 1111 versus essentially something lower like a bookkeeper. All right. So uh, good. Yeah. And I can tell you guys, all of you guys, that when I'm doing these, um, when I'm doing my consultations, questions about reference letters probably forms a part of almost every single consult that I do. So people that have questions can book a consult and we can go through specifically to make sure that you have selected your proper NOC and that the reference letter that you have actually works for the purposes of express entry. So great question, Vivek. I'll put you there. And now I'm gonna jump to the next one. And this question is from Samita, and uh, it's about 28.50. Samita says, hi Mark, a quick question. Is it true that recruiters in Canada are biased and prefer to interview or hire people from countries other than from, oh, interesting. <laughs> As you can see, I don't always read these. Um, then from India, Pakistan, and China. I've heard they do not prefer... Uh, employees from these countries as they fear the communication gap that might be created later. Is this true? Samita, it doesn't matter where you're from, whether it's Canada, India, Nigeria, the US, Pakistan. The key is they want to know that you are going to be a good fit for their company. One of the most important aspects of that is English, the ability to communicate in English. And so when you're talking about communication gap, you're 100% right. If Canadians are not able to understand you, then you're going to have a far less chance of getting a job than someone who is a fluent native English speaker. 
And that's just like if I was to go to India and I didn't speak Hindi or any other dialect and I wanted to get a job and I couldn't communicate with anyone or I had a weird English accent trying to speak Hindi, um, more than likely the company is going to say, hmm, this person is going to be less uh, productive, less effective than a native, you know, in Hindi speaking person. Now, whether that person is, if there, someone is coming from India or Pakistan and China, well, yeah, there's, there's um, an employer is going to look at that and take that into consideration versus someone coming from the UK or Scotland or US or Australia. That's just by its very nature. But if you have the ability to demonstrate your, your ability to speak in English and communicate very well, I've seen many, many people from India or otherwise who write, who speak, who who read faster, who understand English and are able to are able to communicate better in English than some native born Canadians. And so it just depends on how well you communicate. But for sure, Samita, there is an uh, there is um, a tendency for employers in Canada to um, uh, to not give citizens of India and Pakistan and China the same benefit of the doubt, I guess, that they would if you were from Australia or, or, or the U.S., for instance. So is it a reality? Yeah, it is. You have to work harder. You have to find different ways to prove your ability to speak. But that's only one, one small component to the whole decision that an employer makes when they're trying to determine whether or not to hire someone or who was the best fit for their company. All right? And obviously, one last piece that I'll give you is that it depends on the job. You know, if you're working in IT and you're just speaking in code, you're writing in code and, you know, you're a developer or, or, or you know, whatever you are, and there isn't really much of a need to have a high command of the English language, well, then that's going to play different than, than someone who's like a public relations specialist for a company. All right. I think you get that question. Good question. Okay. Last one is uh, Mahesh. And this one is going to be a little bit longer. Um, it's a little bit more involved, but we'll see what we can do. This is regarding proof of funds. And I think those of you who are listening will really benefit from this one. So a big thank you for your valuable advice and counseling. You've been a great blessing for many aspiring immigrants like me. God bless. Thanks, Mahesh. Certainly, we are in the documents submission stage post receiving the ITA. Congratulations. We will submit all the required documents by the end of this week. Before I could do that, I had two questions on proof of funds to clarify. So I have multiple fixed deposits with different maturity dates to show for my proof of funds as evidence. So a couple of them are having a maturity date within four months, while I believe the average processing time uh, to complete the process is about six months by CIC. And that's correct. So would it affect our application timeline to be delayed due to the expiry of some of our maturity fixed deposits? What do you suggest? Shall we renew and submit the fixed deposit with longer maturity dates, i.e. more than six months? Um, and then he says, uh, so what should we do? So obviously you have to understand that the government gets it. Money is money. And as long as you can prove where it came from, the source, if you, if you feel like it's not a big deal to, you know, extend the maturity date, then do it. If it's a hassle, you don't need to worry about it. Even if you have to pull the money out and then re-put it in something else, as long as you can trace where it's coming from, you're going to be just fine. The issues that they have is when the money isn't yours at all. And then they start to question, all right, is this actually going to be um, money that's to be used and available by Mahesh? Or is this just someone giving them a short-term loan just to prove to the government they have money, but really they don't have control over it? Or will we'll be able to use it for the purposes of landing in Canada? And so that's the bigger issue. But if you can tra trace your money, then that's totally fine. There isn't an issue about it. The next question Mahesh asks is uh, the address details. Um, it looks like on his fixed deposit certificate, they're different. So they contain old addresses. Well, if that's the case, then if you can update your, your account, um, if you can't update your, your address, then it's not a big deal. You just need to explain, okay? And if you have an old address on there for your fixed deposit, and that old address matches with an address that you've listed in your in your residence or your <clears throat> your personal history for the past 10 years, then, hey, there's no issues at all. But if the address is from an even older period of time, then just explain it. That's what the letters of explanation are for. The client, the additional client information sections in, in Express Entry, they're all designed to allow you to explain situations like this that just don't fit into the norm. So, great question, Mahesh. 
And guys, I want to thank you for being patient. And uh, right now, as of this moment, we will open it up and I will start to answer some of the live questions. And so um, if you guys want to go through and post your comments now, I will answer the live questions. All right. And while we're just uh, working through this, I want to let you guys know of a couple things. Uh, if some of you are tuning in a little bit later um, while we're waiting for those questions to build up here and I can see them starting to come in. So Razib will be the first question and then I will work down from Razib who's living in the US. Okay. <clears throat> but before we get there, I just want to share a couple things with you. First thing right here, which side do I got it on? Right here. <clears throat> Full representation, um, I have until tomorrow. It actually expires tomorrow, October the 10th um, at 4.30 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. So my assistant has time to actually review it. If you want to hire me to do your full application at 2,500, this is coming to an end tomorrow. I usually charge 5,000. After tomorrow, the rate will be 5,000 for full representation. And so this is my gold plan. And um, you're gonna get me. So if you want to take advantage of this offer, you can do that, um, but it has to be by tomorrow. Otherwise, I'm not gonna extend the offer anymore and it will be at the regular rate. So that's that one. And I also wanna let everybody know that, if I stick it up here, that this whole thing is, is possible because of the Express Entry Complete Step-by-Step -step Guide to Doing It Yourself. And a lot of you guys have already gone on and I may be even telling you guys, um, uh, I'm just gonna pull this up here. Uh, many of you guys are I know already know about this because for the simple reason um, you've already subscribed and it's unbelievable how many people have actually subscribed to this but I want you guys to know that this express entry complete step-by-step -step guide to doing it yourself is your walkthrough of the whole process from the beginning learning the basics right here you can see the first one is learning the basics to preparing to submit your express entry profile to completing your profile to completing your EAPR after you get your ITA, which is really the most important part that people want to know about, and information on the document checklist, uploading them. And then I've got a whole section devoted to member resources. So this is where my best, best videos are kept. And a number of these are not publicly available. They're only available um, to you guys. So that those actually who purchased the guide. So if this is something that you are interested in, those who are actually listening to this right now, I have kept my 50% off open to people who actually watch this video. And so I don't advertise it anywhere, but if you click in enroll in course and you click on enroll right here, wait till this comes up, I have a very special coupon code that is available for people who are watching these videos and it's open to you youtubers as well if you click on add coupon it's regular 497 but if you type in e e d i y 50 percent and click apply you will get 50 percent off for 248.50 and that is lifetime access so that is what you guys have looking uh available to you if you're interested and if you just want to jump on for a month, then it's $97 a month. And uh, the payment plan is only available um, for the full payment price. So if you want to have access over a lifetime and don't have the $250, but want to spread it out over six months, you can do that at $87 US. So I wanted to share all of that with you fine folks. And now it is time to get to you patient, super awesome listeners who are watching live. Okay, there's a whole bunch that's come up. So now I'm going to shift back here and get to the one I said I was going to start on. And that was Razib. There it is. Okay, so Razib, here's Razib's question. I'm residing in the US right now and planning to land in Canada by driving. Can I rent a car and drive it? Will they let me in? I'm planning to return the car in Canada the next day. I'm planning to stay for a few weeks there and come back to the U.S. before my next semester starts. Razib, there's no problems with that at all. You just need to make sure that you've got the documentation and the paperwork to show um, that you are renting it legally and that you intend to drop it off in Canada. And so as long as that's all documented, then you're not going to have any problems, my friend. So congratulations. That's super cool. That's awesome. So I'm assuming you're just finishing up school 
And remember, every permanent resident needs to show that they have lived in Canada for at least two years in every five-year period to keep that permanent resident status. So don't stay out too long, Razib. Don't stay out too long. Okay, Gia says, um, let's see. Oh, Gia, this is super long, my friend. Let's see if, I'll try to skip through it, okay? Um, uh, okay, let's see if I can figure this out. Okay, apologies for the long message and thanks a million in advance. I submitted my EAPR in July of 2018. Okay, so it's already been filed. Give me one second here. <coughs> I had a little sneeze. Um, I, okay, the proof of funds which I provided did not indicate my current balance. My bank only provided me an official letter with account number, date open, and electronic bank statement with a letter of explanation. As long as those bank statements show how much money you had in your account, you're probably going to be okay. There's nothing you can do now. If you've already submitted your EAPR, the right time to ask me these questions, Gia, is before you submit it. Once you submit your EAPR, everything is locked in and you really do not have a great ability to fix things. It's always up to the discretion of the officer. And so people will send it through a case-specific inquiry at CS <coughs> a CSE. <coughs> but the reality is after the fact, that's not the time to be looking. Otherwise, you could get your application returned for being incomplete. Okay, for my police clearance, the PCC which I submitted for home country was dated May 2018. However, <clears throat> I went back to my home country in August of 2018 and stayed there for two months. I stayed in my home country more than six months in 2013 only. So the key is six months or more in a row and you filed your application in July 2018. So you're not, it, it's going to be locked in at that time. All your address history, all of your travel, your, your travel history is all going to be, it's all going to predate that trip back in August. And so generally speaking, and understand, I don't know your whole situation, but <clears throat> that shouldn't be an issue with you. <clears throat> Excuse me. And there isn't an obligation to update unless an officer asks about travel. So things lock in when you submit your application. Okay. And so, no, you don't want to, you, you shouldn't need to, to submit a new letter of explanation and a new PCC. Okay, great question. Okay, uh, Faison says, I've done my master's degree, um, <clears throat> ECA, which is equivalent to a four-year bachelor's. Okay, recently I received my LLB result for assessment of my LLB degree. It will take at least two months. So in the meantime, can I fill in my immigration form by mentioning two bachelor's degrees? And hopefully if I get an ITA, after that, within two months, I have to upload the documents. So hopefully I'll get my ECA assessment results and I will upload it. Is it possible? Um, Faison, I never, ever take a chance when I'm submitting my profile. Now, the only circumstance that I would submit a profile before I actually had the proof, in other words, the ECA comes back and actually confirms you have two or more degrees. Um, the only time I would ever do that is if someone was at 440 points right now. In other words, 440 or 441, because the reality is um, you may never get drawn again. So sometimes you do have to play the odds. And that's where just the experience I have working with people helps me to understand what I should do and what I shouldn't. Because the last thing you want to do is submit a profile that you can't prove and then get an ITA that you're going to have to decline anyways. So in your situation, unless your, your CRS score is 440 or 441, you don't want to, um, you, you usually don't want to submit it because you could get your ITA and then it not even come in time because you only have 60 days to get the document submitted after you get your ITA. Okay, so that's my thoughts on that, Faison. Okay, Kishan says, hello, Mark, listening from Sarnia. Um, just had a question. In India, I have two years, 10 months of software experience. So can I add three years or more as my work experience? If not, apart from that, I came here on a study visa and I had four months summer break where I did an internship in software, which was not part of my studies. Can I count this to qualify for three or more years? Um, uh, so two years plus 10 months in India plus four months internship. Thank you. And a big thank, thanks to you for helping. Happy Thanksgiving. To, to claim any Canadian work experience, you can't be on a study permit. So if you were during your internship, then you can't claim that four months. And if you're 10 years, 10 months, even if you accumulated, you know, more than 1,560 hours a year, so double that, whatever that is, 
3,120 or something. I don't know. That's why I'm a lawyer, not a mathematician. Even if you accumulated more or enough total hours to justify three years, I guess it would be three times 1,560. It doesn't work. You, you have to actually have worked those years. And so in your case, no, you can't claim the three if you're under three. And if you're on a study permit in Canada, the other four are, are likely not going to be eligible either. Okay, Razib got another question in here. I'll answer it for you, Razib. He said, if I'm carrying statements from banks during my landing, is there going to be any difference between checking and saving accounts? I'm planning to have statements from both types of accounts along with my 401k plan statement. That's totally fine, Razib. It does not matter. It doesn't. You, as long as you <coughs> can show that those funds are there, you can have um, checking, savings. It's irrelevant. Okay. Um, Vemula says, I have 390 CRS. Can I apply for a PNP? My profession is hospital uh, billing. Can you suggest any province? So Vemula, I only do detailed individual assessments via consultation. So I'll put the link. Actually, I'll just show you guys here. Those of you who are watching for the first time are, are probably wondering, well, how do I book a consult with you, Mark, or how do I hire you? Well, the um, the best way to do that, let's see if I can, is to go to this link right here. And this is the link on my um, my firm website that allows people to connect with me and book a consultation. And right now, I, I charge $200 for a 30-minute consult. But what you guys need to understand is that even before the consult starts, I take some time to review the information that you've provided to me. And so understand that it is... Um, it's not just a simple 30 minutes and then when it's done, Mark kicks me loose. So I will put the consult link into the comment section here and I'll also try to put it on the YouTube channel as well. Okay. All right. Uh, next we are going to, <clears throat> let's see who's next. Oh boy, you guys keep posting your questions so fast. It's hard for me to stay on top of them. Uh, okay. Let's see if I can go back to, okay. So here we go. Um, Okay, this is Tran. And understand, if I skip through yours, it's not my fault. Facebook tends to organize these comments in a lot of different ways. And so if I miss yours, I apologize. Okay, um, so Tran says, Hi, Mark. Can I ask if you don't mind, as an international student, what is the maximum hour students can work during scheduled breaks? 20 hours during school, but full time during scheduled breaks. But the reality is you're in Canada. And so each province has employment standards. And those employment standards dictate that if you are working more hours than a regular day, which is essentially maxed out at nine, nine hours a day, <coughs> then you have to be paid overtime. And each province is a little bit different, but that's the distinction. So you can work a lot of hours during your regular breaks, like Christmas holiday or summer break. But um, the only really cap is that you have to be um, paid and compensated and they have to maintain uh, employment standards minimums. Okay. Uh, Imran says, I have a joint current account with my father. Can I use it as proof of funds? Yes, but I would make sure that you have an affidavit or a sworn statement from your father saying that the funds are completely for your use for settling in Canada, that they're irrevocable and that um, in no way are they only a loan for you. Okay. Uh, Kabir says, I'm in Canada and I've been for about six months. Bulk of my funds would be for my savings for my current job, but since my employment is less than a year and I'm not getting any points for it, I decided not to declare it under work history, but under personal history. I'm already at 444. My question is, do I still need to get a reference letter from my employer or attach pay slips uh, to show proof of funds? My bank statement has the perfect description as remuneration weekly. Thank you. Um, when it comes to your reference letter, the first question is, no, you don't have to provide a reference letter. Um, when you are not claiming work history. So if you haven't listed in your work history, then you're not gonna be expected to provide a reference letter for that. It shouldn't trigger one. And if it does, then there's something wrong with the system. Um, so uh, as far as uh, proof of funds, that's a, different, that's a different equation, that's a different discussion. So if your bank letter is sufficient and it covers off everything that you need um, that IRCC asks for, then you're gonna be just fine. Um, I don't anticipate there being any issues. But yeah, as far as uh, providing work history for something that you don't um, claim work history for, like you don't need to provide a reference letter to do that. All right, Kabir, great question. 
Now I'm just going to take a quick peek and make sure I don't have another consult coming up given it's 104 p.m. This day has been crazy. Give me one second. Okay, it looks like it's coming at 1.30, so I've got time to answer a few more questions here. Um, okay, Nav says, I'm unable to get a reference letter from my employer, but I do have a letter of employment which states some of the things, so can I just upload the pay stubs in employment record or what else I can do from employment record? Thank you. I actually, within my, <laughs> if I go back here and I go to here, um, and I go back to my Canadian Immigration Institute, this is another thing that you guys have to realize. For that limited amount, you get tons of extra content that answers some of the most frequently asked questions. And if you go down here, I actually, and I'll blow this up, and this is just the main landing page. In here, I actually have um, reference letters. So this one in particular, if my employer will not give me a reference letter, what do I do? This is a comprehensive video that is actually found in my YouTube channel. Um, and I have other ones that are based on podcasts um, that give answers and specific instructions on all the various things that you can do to claim your work experience. And actually, this is probably one of the best ones. Um, but like I said, do not share this link because this is a video on my YouTube channel that goes into great detail all the different things that you can do. So those who purchase the subscription can actually get access to this. Um, um, and I also give access to it to people who are booking um, paid consults with me as well. But for, for your purposes, um, I just want to tell you that um, when you cannot get all of the information that you need, uh, in order to, well, at least in your reference letter, in the way that IRCC wants you to have it, um, then you just have to do the best you can. So if you have other sources that confirm how much you are paid or your duties, then they can't just come from a statement from you, but you can use other third-party information, offer letters, um, you can use any job descriptions that you have within your your um, uh, within the company that are just out there floating around, general ones. Um, you can use uh, supervisors or employers uh, or, or you know coworkers or whatever you need to can attest to your duties. And then any other documents, if you have tax documents, if you have payroll, like you said, if you've got bank statements showing that the money is deposited, all of those can be used to kind of fill in all those gaps that may come with a reference letter that's not complete. So good question. Okay, let's see if I can find my spot again. And then I'm gonna go just a little bit more until um, about 110, and then I'm gonna have to shut it down. Okay. Uh, wow, there's a lot of questions, you guys. Okay. Um, Okay, I'll ignore Dr. Muhammad Elam. I don't know what he's asking. Karen says, my ALTS is 4.5. Um, it's okay to get express entry? No, Karen. Your IELTS has to be at least an 8 in listening and 7 in all others. Otherwise, you really won't have a chance unless you somehow are already working in Canada. And then even then, 4.5 is, is going to be right on the border. Okay, uh, Gia says, thanks a lot, Mark. God bless. You're very welcome. Okay, Razib's got another question. I'm attending school in the U.S., I knew that, and planning to spend the summers in Canada as I won't be taking any classes during the summers. Are those summers months going to be counted towards the accumulation of my presence in Canada? Yeah, just make sure that you have a residence. Make sure you have an ability to prove it. Okay, um, I applied for a holiday visa, Mary says. Uh, how long it can take to be picked up from the pool to interview? Um, August the 18th, you applied, thank you. Um, Marie, this is a question that's outside of express entry, but I just go with the processing times that IRCC has. So if I try to reply to yours, I'll go here, and I will just give you um, the link right here so everybody can see. I'm just gonna copy this link right here, and then I'll stick it right in answer to your question. Um, this is the link for processing times, and it's actually pretty close. So if we go back here, and when we select, if you want to find out what it is for visitor visas or temporary resident visas, then you're going to go here, and you're going to click on temporary residence, which is basically visitor visas, you can see right here. Okay, and then you pick the country that you're in. And um, 
So visitor extension, super visa, um, a visitor visa from outside Canada is probably the one you're looking for. And then it tells you to choose your country. So if I take Angola in Africa, processing times, it says are 16 days. So you get a decision pretty quick. So it just depends. That's how you have to look. And if it's being hung up or delayed, then, you know, and, and they're scheduling you for an interview, then that's something that needs to be taken very seriously because rarely do they invite people in for interviews. If there is an interview, it means that they're looking at refusing and for some reason want to give you the benefit of the doubt. Usually they, they just refuse if they don't believe. So understand if you're in that queue, uh, Mary, and there's a possibility you could be going for an interview, make sure you're well prepared. All right. Let's see if I can go back and find where I was left off here. Okay. Um, Momin says I got a gift deed in August, but I took very little money out of that account. I will still have a gift deed affidavit and sufficient funds while filing application. Is it an issue to have taken out some funds out of a gift deed money? No, it isn't. As long as you've got enough to cover the minimum requirements by IRCC, no, it doesn't matter. Um, you just need to make sure that you've got sufficient. Okay, Susan, uh, do you know if I can have two applications in for PR? I have one for PR with h &C considerations. Is it possible for me to also um, add an application for PR as a caregiver for people with high, need, high medical needs? Um, you can have multiple PR applications in the queue, Susan. The only thing you can't have is multiple sponsorships. So if you're here sponsoring a family member or someone else, you can't have multiple sponsorships at the same time, but you can have multiple permanent resident applications. In fact, I do it all the time. If I feel like a person is eligible for a PNP, then I go through that route. If I feel like um, a person is el eligible for express entry, then I do both. And whichever one gets through first, that's the one I use because the government is ruthless. They have routinely refused applications for the smallest things. And I don't want to take any chances with my clients. So if I have more than one option, in many cases, I'll pursue them both. Okay, AN says, I've been paid in cash. Is that a problem? I have my employer's reference letter and payslips as a proof. The reference letter and payslips are what the government asks. So those are the minimum requirements. If they want to come back and ask for further evidence, then that's fine. But if you've got a reference letter that works and you've got payslips pay to confirm as proof, those are the specific things the government asks for. So I don't see an issue with that, Ian. Okay, Nav says, hi, Mark, in my supporting documents for PR application, it's written that Police Certificate India is required. Does it mean I don't need a PCZ from Canada as I'm in Canada from the last three years? Um, I'll show you something here, okay? Uh, let's go back here for, this is for Nav. So I always follow the specific instructions that IRCC gives. So I go IRCC, police clearances, and then I go here, how to get a police clearance. And then I select, I go down here to Canada. And this is what I recommend for all of you guys. I go to Canada and then I click on find out how to apply. And so do I need to provide a police certificate with my application for permanent residence? Okay, so the answer is no, you don't. We will tell you if you need a Canadian criminal record check. Okay, so that's the answer right there. And it's always, I always go back to the source. I never take chances. Good question. All right. Okay. Um, I think, let's see here. I'm just scrolling through here. I want to get back to where I was. I think, guys, I'm going to have to end there for today. Yeah, I'm going to stop there because I'm already at one, one uh a little over an hour right now and I have another consult coming up. But I wanna thank all of you guys for being here, for supporting, for participating. I know the hour, the time is not the greatest. Um, as always, I'm gonna remind you once again, Express Entry Complete Step-by-Step -step Guide. You guys remember the code, right? I showed you. So if you go in here and you wanna get access at the 50% off, all you have to do is go to the Canadian Immigration Institute and that's what I type in, canadianimmigrationinstitute.com and it will take you to the, the course. I click and enroll in the course. I click and enroll in the lifetime, one-time purchase, lifetime access, and then in the coupon code, and keep it a secret. Only those who watch the video will get benefit from it. I click on the add coupon as soon as it loads up here. It's thinking apparently. I guess this video is taking up too much bandwidth here in the firm. I click on add coupon and the coupon code is EE 
DIY 50 and then the percent sign. And let's see if I can blow this up really big for everybody to see. Okay, there, I think most people can see it now if my, if my ugly mug isn't blocking it off. But that's all you have to do. Um, and actually, maybe that's even a little bit better. So you can see right here, there is the code right there, EEDIY50. And when you apply it, it drops the price. So, but it's only for people that are watching the videos and that are going to get rewarded. So that's that. Uh, so those two things there, guys, are what I have going on. And I guess the last thing that I'll share with you, uh, which I started, which I shared at the beginning, is right here. So remember that as of tomorrow, this will come to an end. It's my 50% off full representation. And it's it's available only until tomorrow, and then it will come to an end. Now I have 430 here, but the reality is it's probably I, I'm only gonna take clients that have they're at 40 440 just because we haven't seen it drop below 440 and the pnps that were available at this level are really not so all right so that is that's the end thanks so much for listening i appreciate all of the support that you guys do that you guys give um lately within our express entry law private facebook group i've seen a few posts coming in from spammers that are posting really inappropriate uh, material and so I really need you guys to advise the moderators and myself the moment you see anything inappropriate, post it. Because then we can delete it and keep this, this group safe and just a, a place where people can get the information they need without scammers and those nasty people out there that we just don't want a, a part of our family. All right, this is Mark Holthy, Canadian immigration lawyer, ex-immigration officer, and former high school teacher. Thanking you so much for tuning in. And I want to wish all of you guys a wonderful, wonderful week and uh, lots of luck as you navigate this crazy world we call Express Entry. Take care, everyone.